Go ahead and give him praise today. Lord, we give you honor, we give you glory, we give you praise. There's no other name like your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on and praise him like he brought you through. Praise him like he was there all the time. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. We praise you. We're not ashamed to praise you. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Praise the mighty name of Jesus. Woo, that's good music. That's anointed music. Don't you love him today? Oh, hallelujah. I don't know what you came to do, but I came to praise the Lord. Oh, does anybody feel he's really worthy? Deep, deep from the recesses of your heart, something wants to give him all the glory. Give him all the praise. Give him all the crowns. Cast them at his feet. so glad that this is a praising church. If we ever lose this, we've lost it all because he inhabits the praises of his people. Welcome to all of you, all of you joining us at all of our campuses and our online campus. Just give them a big warm welcome this morning. We appreciate you so very much. Smile at three people, at least three people. Smile and say, you look amazing today and you smell good too. God bless you. Hallelujah. That's so good. That's good. Y'all want to do our song? We'll do it later. We'll do it later. We'll do it later. This is a good time to preach. The temperature feels right. I was told that Bobby and Sandy Ferguson are here this morning at our Georgia, at our Gainesville campus. Where are you at, Bobby? Sandy, I don't mean to put you on the spot and the boys are they here too but their 20 year old son was in a horrible accident about a week ago and he's in the intensive care up in northeast Georgia and uh, to see you here this morning when the sun won't shine praise just, I mean, it's more than a song when you're going through that. It's more than a song when you're going through that. That praise and that worship cost you something. We love you. This church loves you. I don't ever want us to get so big that we can't take time to tell people we love them and that they matter and that we care about them. And uh, in Jesus' name, all things are possible. And we're believing for a miracle. Say amen, church. Say amen. We believe in miracles around this place. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open them with me for a few moments to the book of Romans, the third chapter. Tell my favorite choir and praise team, unless I'm at your campus. Tell them how much we love and appreciate them. Y'all sound good today. That bless, that bless my socks off. Amen. We're delighted today to have some very special guests, and they don't like attention, don't like it. They don't been several times. I never get the same thing, but I'm the pastor of this church, and I can say what I want to say. 
but we're delighted to have Mark and Cindy Pentecost and their dear friend Chris and uh, special guests from Florida and special friends of this ministry in, in, in remarkable ways that God knows all about. But thank you for being here. It's an honor for Sharice and I to have you here today. I like his last name, Pentecost. That's his real name, Pentecost. Turn to somebody and say, I hope you become Mr. and Mrs. Pentecost before you leave this service. That's powerful. What a name. What a name. All right. I want to go quickly, and I won't preach long this morning, but I want to go to the third verse of Romans chapter 3. Paul asked a question that is so important. This really stood out to me in my spirit this week. For what if some do not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true and let every man be a liar, as it is written. I love this question Paul asked. He, he said, if God's promised you something, if God's put a dream in your heart, if God's given you a word about your family, if God's given you a promise in the scriptures, confirmed by his spirit, I'm not talking about just something you wish and you want. I'm talking about when God has birthed something in your heart and you know he's spoken to you about it. He asked the question, what if some don't believe? What if, and so I'm gonna preach today on so what if they don't believe? He said, if they don't believe what God has told you that you could do and would do by his help and by his power and his anointing, if they don't believe in the dream that he has given you, if they say it will not happen, you're not talented enough, you're not gifted enough, you're not good looking enough, you're not important enough, if everybody is not going to believe in you, can you still hold on to it? So many people just absolutely allow the affirmation of people to hold their dream hostage in the call and the purpose and the plan of God for their life. When, when there is clearance from all the right people, then I can believe it. But there comes times in life when God will give you standalone faith. And it's not that you don't need people and it's not that you are arrogant and proud and, and as though, you know, you feel like you can do everything. Oh, I don't need nobody. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you know that you know that you know God said it. Then you have to reach a point that you begin to ask the question that Paul asked when he said, so what if they don't believe? Does that make the word of God to no effect? Does that make the faithfulness of God Canceled out? No. He told me he was going to do something. Does their unbelief make the word of God to no effect? Can they cancel out what you know God has promised you in his word, confirmed out of the mouth of two or three witnesses? You fasted about it. You prayed about it. You found it in the word. You've got people praying with you, and you know that you know. There will always be opposition to your dream. So what if they don't believe? So what if they don't see what you see? It's your dream. They, your, the dream doesn't walk away when they walk away. He put it in your belly. He put it in your spirit of possibility. He put it in your heart, and he gave you the giftings to make it come to pass. I actually had someone say this to me recently, just in the last few days, they said to me, Pastor, I don't understand why everything is not going smooth and easy. If I'm in the will of God, isn't it supposed to be, and I had to put my hand up, isn't it supposed to be smooth and easy all the time? And I said, well, Jesus was in the will of the Lord and they crucified him. But he rose on the third day. I'm not telling you you won't go through it. But I'm telling you God's will and God's plan will be done. So what if they don't believe? 
There will always be people who don't believe. But when you've got a real dream, like Joseph, they can throw you into a pit and God will still bring you out. And they can throw you in into a prison and the dream will still be kicking. And they can th falsely accuse you and pass you up and promote people over you and you still believe. They can shut the door and throw away the key and that's what they did to Joseph. But the dream was still kicking in him because when God gives you a dream, so what if they don't believe? I've come this morning to preach to dreamers. I've come this morning to tell you by faith it's still going to happen. You've got, you've got a nagging dream. You've got a dream you can't shake. You've got a dream that just when you ought to give up on it, and they, he said, she said, they said, it's not going to happen. But what did God say? So what if they don't believe? All God needs is your faith, and he'll cause the people to come in line. Real dreams do not die when opposition comes. And I came to preach to dreamers. So what if they don't believe? Tell somebody beside you, it's still going to come to pass. Do it. Do it. Say it. Say it out loud. There's still some things in me that are going to happen that haven't happened yet. You don't have to believe in my dream. I hope you do. I really want you to. But I don't base the dream God gives me on who stays and who goes. If he gave it to me, he's got the people lined up. I want to give you three things you need if you're going to hold on to the dream that God gives you and the promise and the word that God gives you. Three things. Number one, you've got to, you've got to determine the origin or the, the place that that dream came from. What's the origin of the dream? Is it God's dream or is it your dream? Because God's not obligated to back up dreams he didn't give you. Did it originate from God? You see, a lot of people are living in somebody else's dream. Parents have to be careful. We have to be careful that we don't put this on our children. And it's something we always wanted to do. And, they, and, and so we just say, you've got to do this. You've got, I actually have had people, and I was telling them in the first service, there was, I, I've had a man that came not too long ago, and he was in his 40s, maybe 50 years old. And he's, and he's so upset, very successful, very blessed, a tremendous blessing but he's upset because he said, but my granny wanted me to be a preacher. And she said, when I was a little child that I looked like a preacher and she's dead and gone to heaven. And here's a successful man and he's tormented because he, and he said, they told me all my life as a child, I looked like a little preacher. And I'm like, what does a preacher look like? I've seen fat preachers. I've seen skinny preachers. I've seen tall preachers. I've seen handsome preachers. I've seen ugly preachers. I, 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 how can you say you look like? You better have more than a look like if you're going to get in the ministry. You better. I appreciate my mama. She said, where's you at, mom? Did she come to church today? Well, that praise the Lord. You came to church today. That's good. I was checking up on you. But mom, I, you know, she never called me into the ministry, but had she called me into the ministry, that would not be enough for the things that I faced. I had to know what God told me. And you know, it didn't matter. So what if they don't believe? So what if somebody laughs when you tell them and mocks and says you're crazy and don't, there's a key, don't tell everybody your dream. But you know what happens is people wake up and they're living in somebody else's dream. God never called you to do that. Identify the origin of your dream. And don't live and have a dream just because of the expectations of people. I thought about this. You know, a lot of people have dreams because they were overlooked, <clears throat> because they're inferior. They have an inferior complex. They are insecure because during their childhood or whatever, they were neglected, they were ignored, they were overlooked, they were not the favorite child they felt like. And so if you don't watch it, you go around trying to prove something through a dream. And they become successful not because that's what they want, but they something in them yearns to be accepted. Something in them yearns to to 
to prove to somebody, you know, I'm going to show mama that I'm as good as the other daughter that she has. Or your whole motivation in life is to show them. Am I making sense this morning? You know, just show them. And uh, uh, for example, you know, uh, it may be you, somebody in your family or maybe uh, your ex-husband or, you know, you're going to get that car, but it's not just a good dream to have a car for transportation that all you need, but you really got it. And that's why you drive it by your ex's house about 14 times a day, because you want him to know I got it without you. I got it without you. That's not, that's a perverted dream. Say amen, somebody. Here, let me put it to you like this. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. But is the dream born of the Spirit? Because if God is the origin of the dream, then God obligates himself to bring all the pieces together that are needed to fulfill that dream. Secondly, you have to determine the resources that you have because they will fit the dream that God gives you. You've got to do inventory of the gifts and the talents and the skills and the abilities that God has given you. God has given you resources and talents and the gifts that he's given you is enough in seed form. They may have to be developed. They may have to be coached. They may have to be mentored. Somebody may have to show you who you really are and help you bring out some of the gifts. But if God gave you the dream, the talent, the gifting is not in somebody else. It's in you. It should be an indication, your gifts, your talents, your desire should be an indication of the dream that God has for you. I believe when God gives you a dream, he gives you what you need to fulfill that dream. The talent, the skill, the ability. If you can't sing, I doubt God's called you to the praise team. Everybody else knows that. Why don't you accept that? He puts it on the inside of you. You've got what you need to get the dream going. It's not in somebody else. It's in you. Well, if they had noticed me, if they had given me a break, if that person would give me that, if that person would open up that door, if that person would do this for me, then, then I could do it. You know, that was the mistake that Sarah, Abraham's wife, made in the Bible. She had a dream to have a baby, but she got so old and her husband got so old and they were not able, they were, they were infertile and they couldn't have a baby. And do you know what? She thought that her dream had to come through somebody else. But anytime God puts the dream in you, he puts the ability to make it happen. But, but she thought, well, what I'll do is I'm tired of waiting on God. So what I'll do is she went and told Abraham to go into Hagar and have a night uh, there in a little situation and, 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 and get her pregnant. And see there, that's being born in the flesh. And she gave birth to Ishmael and she said, I'll keep the baby. But the dream is dependent upon somebody else. Do you understand? God never wants the dream dependent on somebody else doing what they do for you. He, he allows all of that and puts kingdom connections in your life. But you can't let, if, because if you make that person an idol or that situation or whatever it is that you think God has to use to make it happen, once you start praying to those people, help me, help me, help me, then you start praying, P-R-E-Y-I-N-G, on people because you begin to try to motivate and see them as your source. Thank God for people. But here's what I've learned. People are resources. God is the source. People are resources. And sometimes resources change, but the source is Jehovah Jireh, and he'll always provide. Clap your hands and say amen, somebody. God gave a dream, but she thought that the only way that that dream would be produced was through somebody else's gifting and talent and body. She started looking to other people. She looked to someone else. God's going to birth your dream, not by somebody else's gifts and talents, but even, even 
when you feel like you don't have it, you don't know what you have if God put it in you. And when you compare yourself to other people, you insult your creator. When you compare and say, I wish I was that person. I wish I had that. I wish I could do that. I wish I had that talent. I'm telling you today that God said when he gave you the dream, he gave you the talent and the ability. And that's why you need him. Without him, you can do nothing. God says, I'm not going to use somebody else's gifts. Look at somebody and say, you're going to push this one out. She thought, she, thought, she thought Hagar would push it out and give birth to it, but you're going to push this one out. He'll give you a dream, and you can provide that dream. Say amen, somebody. The gifts are there. The talent is there. I'm going to use you. If they, pastor, if they. If they, that's not God's will. If God's called you, he said, so what if they don't believe? You believe. I even thought about how that we, we get to a place in our life where the gifts that we have, we don't even recognize how powerful they are. Sometimes you have to say to yourself, I've got it. I've got it. I can do this. I've got it. By his grace, I've got it. I can, Paul said. I can do all things. There it is. Through Christ who strengthens somebody else. Me. God gave Moses a dream. He didn't have the support of Pharaoh. He didn't have the support of the people who were, he was even trying to help. But he kept believing it. And God brought the dream to pass. I was in California a couple weeks ago. Sharice and I, and I, and we had a sleepover with the grandkids and little Luca and Leo, uh, five and four year old. And uh, I was telling them a story in the bed, a Bible story. I do that and I use my imagination with those little children to hold her. And, and so I, I told them about Moses and I told them about how that he had a stutter and, and, and I acted that out and he went to, went to the Pharaoh and first God called a bush on fire and they, their eyes got big and I just really did that, did that up big and, and, and ended up with uh, him standing before Pharaoh and he said, let my Pee, 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 people go, and, 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 and all of a sudden, uh, Pharaoh said, I will not do it. I will not let them go. And I said, you know what happened, Luca and Leo? And they said, what? I said, God sent frogs, and the frogs started hopping up the stairs. They came through the windows. They jumped into the fruit loops. They were frogs hopping. They were everywhere. And then I put my hand up under the sheet, and and I said, I think there's one in the bed now. They're all over the place. Frogs, frogs were, and they were giggling and laughing. We went on playing. And then Cherie said, get them to sleep. Get them to sleep. And, and, and right before we, they were going to sleep, Luca spoke up. And he said, I won't tell that story, G Daddy. I want to tell that story about Mo, 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 Mo. I said, Moses. She, she said, I want to tell about Mo. And, and he said, and he started telling, he did an amazing job. Said the bush, the bush exploded and caught on fire and God talked and, and said, and, and Moses went before Pharaoh and he said, let, 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 let my, 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 my people bo, 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 go. And he said, and, and, and little, little Leo, his sister sat up and just looking at it. She got drawn in again all over. And then he said, and you know what God did Leo? And she said, what? Said God, you know, he's half Australian. God sent kangaroos and they started jumping in the cereal and jumping in the bed well I happen to believe if God said it he can use mice he can use lice he can use grasshoppers he can use kangaroos if he has to but he's got the stuff if you will believe him clap your hands and say amen somebody he said, she said, they said, so what if they don't believe? What did God say? The last thing that I want to say to you is never let the dream that God gives you intimidate you. And by that I mean in two ways. 
Sometimes when you hear a sermon like this, you feel like you're supposed to come up with some big worldwide international dream. And it almost makes you feel like that what the dream God puts in your heart is unimportant. It's not so big and grand seemingly, but some of the most powerful people in the Bible did seemingly insignificant things. And I thought about how that Moses' mother didn't get intimidated by the smallness of her dream. Well, what was the smallness? She had one dream in life. I want to raise godly children in a culture that is anti-God. And the Bible said that Pharaoh and she, 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 I don't want to be Hannah. Like I don't want to be a prophetess. I don't want to be, I, I don't want to be the queen like Esther. I don't want to be, you know, some, I don't want to write a best-selling book. I don't want to do conferences like Joyce. I, I, I don't, I don't want that. What I want to be is a great mother. And she was a bad mama. Because I'm going to prove it to you. When Pharaoh and all of his army were killing all the male children two years of age and under, they killed every child except hers because she hid him. She hid him for three months, and when she couldn't hide him anymore, that fabulous mother made a basket out of bulrush and put him in it and sent him down the Nile River. Alligators, crocodiles, snakes, deep water, an infant, a small toddler, two, two years, under two years of age, in a basket, floating down a massive river. But I need to tell some parent that God knows how to keep our kids in dangerous places. God says they may be out of your reach, but they're not out of my reach. And when you raise them right and you create a basket of faith that you put them in, they may be going down the river and crocodiles may be all around them, but no weapon formed against them. I'm not saying they're not going to go through some stuff, but I am saying what we have. So what if they don't believe? So what if right now they spit on that Bible and mock God and say, I don't believe any of that stuff, virgin birth and resurrection. I've gone to university and I've been enlightened. I'm woke. I know what. You are not woke. What you are is you're going to find out. Out. sooner or later through the trials of life a little bit of time you're gonna come running right back to the very come on so what if they don't believe if you believe God will be faithful see I still believe believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house I still believe Joshua when he said as for me and my house we will not me we will not me and Sharice we will serve the Lord so what if they're on drugs right now? I'm not, I'm not making light of it. I'm simply saying, so what if they're backslid? So what if they've gone into another faith and another religion? Don't you give up. If God promised it, he said, I'm not a man that I can lie. I need somebody to clap your hands like you believe the promise today. Don't let the smallness of the dream. Can you see that? Can you see that baby going down there? And watch the plan of God. And while the baby's going down the river, Pharaoh's daughter just happens to be, if she's five minutes earlier or five minutes later, the basket would have floated on behind the current. But she walks down and she's bathing and she hears a baby crying. And she reaches out and grabs that basket. And she picks up that little baby. And it must have been a little bitty fella because she said, I love this baby. But, you know, uh, it, needs, uh, it needs something to eat. And I, I, can't, I can't feed this baby. I'm not able to breastfeed this child. But I know that there's a lot of mothers whose children have been slaughtered by my father, Pharaoh. 
And about that time, there's one up in the bushes. And she said, um, I've lost my child, but I'll be glad to volunteer and, and take care of that child. And it happened to be Moses' mother. And he said, well, if you'll do it, my daddy, Pharaoh, he'll pay for the diapers and he'll pay for the clothes and he'll pay you to do what you would have done for free. What, what he didn't know. You, know. you know, when you begin to do what God's called you to do, right after that comes the provision, comes the resources. Come, I'm telling you, wouldn't you like to give Pharaoh the whole bill and say, Lord, I'm just going to do what you've called me to do. She got paid to do what she would have done for free. That's when you know you're walking in a dream. When you're doing what you're doing and you would have done it for free. Don't let anybody intimidate you. It seemed like a small thing, just taking, changing diapers. And, and she doesn't have a worldwide international vision. She just has a vision of cake. But Moses brought the Ten Commandments. She had a second son named Aaron. He became the first high priest that would stand before God and stop plagues and offer blood in the holy place. She had a, one daughter, and the daughter's name was Miriam. And the first time we ever see praise and worship in the Bible, it's when they went across the, the Red Sea. She pulled out her tambourine and started singing and writing songs and dancing. In one household, one mother who had a seemingly a small vision produced the Ten Commandments, produced the high priest, and produced the first worship service in all of creation. Don't be intimidated by the smallness of your dream. And lastly, don't be intimidated if the dream that God has given you is bigger than you think you're capable of. You're going to find out sooner or later that God says, if there's a giant between you and the dream, I can handle the giant. I can handle the need. I can handle and I can give you all that you need. The magnitude of the dream sometimes will intimidate you. But when God says it, folks, I look at this building. I'm preaching in six other campuses, beautiful buildings, one downtown Atlanta that's about to get open in a few months. If we can get all the supplies in, we need God to fix, get that stuff off those ships out there. It's holding us up. Do you know we've, we've watched miracles after miracles? We had none of it. But we built this building and all of our buildings are debt free. We owe no man nothing. And when I tell you that, it moves me to my core. Because that was not always the case. But God had the provision. And he still does. I wrote this down last night. God said to tell men and women under the sound of my voice that he's about to finance your dream. He's about to help raise your spiritual babies that you're giving birth to. He's about to open doors no man can shut. He's about to wrap you in a coat of many colors and the favor is going to make you stand out that you walk in. Somebody give God a mighty praise if you believe it. I watched this week, I, I'll close, but this week I had the joy, my daughter Caroline sitting down here, and it's so good to have her and Drake, my son, and Aaron, one day my son-in-law, and Connor, and uh, whatever, and, and um, Caroline said, Dad, Sharice called me and said, she wants to go to the feeding this week because we, we're going to feed 250 families that need groceries. And I'm not talking about just get by stuff. I loved it. Bags of meat. There were steaks. There, were, there, were, there was hamburger. There was bags of meat. Bags of fresh vegetables. Bags of 
fresh fruit and bread and cake and pie. They even had desserts. It was amazing. 250 cars. Y'all know you do this all the time. So I just, I'm ashamed. I had, I'd given to it. I never show, showed up and, and, and actually do it for over an hour. It's one of the greatest experiences of my life to stand in the meat section. Had a ball cap, sweatsuit on, didn't want anybody. To, some, one of the people from the church were taking pictures. I said, don't, I don't want that. Stop. <laughs> but man, when those trunks would come up and those little bitty kids, and some of them you could just tell they desperately, desperately needed it. And to put those bags of groceries in there, it was powerful. It was beautiful. Just a small dream, maybe, to help somebody. But boy, that's a powerful dream. And so God, in his amazing hookup system, the very same week, my cousin called from North Carolina. He's in the chicken business. And his mother, who is mom's sister, named him after me. Isn't that an honor? Named him after me, and, but his name isn't Jensen, it's Jansen. She changed the E to an A, but it's spelled with a Z too, Jansen. And Jansen sent a message this week, and he said, um, I want to do something special for Thanksgiving. Wanted, he's online, he, he's on our online congregation, he and his family. And he said he's very blessed and God's just really blessed his life and blessed his resources and his just business exploded. And he said, I want to do something through my church, Free Chapel. He lives in North Carolina. And he said, uh, I have in my business, you know, I, I, I've decided that how many campuses have y'all got? Well, we've got seven campuses. Okay, well, uh, or six campuses. He, he said, well, here's what I'm going to do. He said, uh, I'm going to send you 140,000 pounds of chicken for Thanksgiving to pass out to families in need. In case you don't know, that's six tractor trailer loads of chicken. And so we then had a guy in the church named Tyler who had a dream to have a trucking company and he and his partner heard about it, because we told him, and, and we said, uh, we need six tractor trailers, and Tyler stepped up and he said, I'm sending the tractor trailers and the drivers, and so at every one of our campuses, we're going to give out tens of thousands of pounds of chicken at every one of them. That's a beautiful thing. Come on, somebody. And then this week, I'm still dreaming. Then this week, we had a group called God Behind Bars. Never heard of these people. God Behind Bars. Not that kind of bar, this kind of bar. God, but he could get behind either one of them. And uh, they said, we are an organization that partners with churches and we followed the ministry and we like and feel like it's a fit and we're asking you to consider something. If you will provide the projector and if you'll provide a praise team and if you'll provide a pastor and if you'll provide, and, I'm, and what are you going to do? You know, you just kept coming. Uh, we will start, we have connections with, we, we're in our local jail every week but they said, we have connections and there's no other church in the state of Georgia doing this. You can open a campus in federal prisons in Georgia and we'll, listen to this, we'll shoot the service live. So I'll not only be preaching over in Gwinnett and Brazelton, Midtown, etc., in Spartanburg and Orange County and all that, but I'll be preaching in the federal penitentiary. Oh! We're going to do that, I'm, in case you hadn't caught on. If you're a little slow, we're going to do that. I don't care what it costs. We're going to do that. And then, <laughs> I'm almost done, I promise. 
but I came to preach to dreamers. How many of you believe Jesus still cares about the prisoners and cares about the poor and cares about those because they may be, they may not look like they've got a lot going on, but sometimes you go through stuff like Joseph where the coat of favor stripped off temporarily. That's when we don't want to be the people in the church where people look at them and say they didn't believe in me when I was down. I believe in people when they're on drugs. I believe in people when they're messed up. I believe in people when they're alcoholics. I believe in people when they don't have nothing. It's not a game around here. We believe God has a plan to raise you. God has a plan to, to, to give you a dream and a purpose that can make a difference. And so one more thing I want to tell you, just tease you. But I went and preached for a friend of mine the other week in Kentucky, Marcus Meekham. He used to be the youth pastor. Now he's the pastor of a mega church. It's exploded. I don't know. It's, it's, it's just amazing. And, 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 and so why don't y'all all stand? Because the dreamers are already standing. But, but, but I'm just saying, what? <laughs> don't, don't move. You got to hear this. So, uh, so he said uh, he, had a, he had a van out in the front of his building. And, and I said, what is that? He said, it's a, it's a women's clinic on wheels. It's got sonogram. It's got, uh, what's the thing that, pregnancy, ultrasound. It's got uh, all kinds of tests that women can do, all kinds of stuff. And that's the small one. But that's not the one that we, we're looking at. There's another one that's even bigger than that. It's, a, it's massive. That's the one. And listen, they're say, it's called Stork. That's the name of the ministry. And you can roll that right up across the street from an abortion clinic. And you can offer an alternative. And you can say, and here's what, here's what we do if we join in with these people we're going to. That right there is going to cost us $480,000. But we're going to get nurses. You have to have a full-time nurse. And you have to have a driver. But they're already out there. Somebody's dream is to drive. Somebody's dream. Somebody got laid off because they wouldn't take some shots. And God says, I got you. I got you. I got you. I'm not against shots. I'm all for shots. Don't, that, not, that, that, just hush. We could put that thing on the road. It could be in a different city in Georgia. And then the Lord spoke to me and said, now, why don't you dream? I said, that is a dream. That's a huge dream. He said, why don't you get on TV and believe that I could put one of those in every state across America? How many of you still believe that life is beautiful and life is precious? And if the church will get its dream back, we don't just curse the darkness. We turn on the light with the love of God. So... So, so help me God, I'm almost done. This is it. So I'm in my office yesterday and sometimes when I'm studying and writing and praying and trying to get it together and it won't come together sometimes, just to be honest, it's so frustrating. It's so pressure. And, and I, what I've learned to do through the years is when I hit those spots, turn on worship. I got a few go-tos. Phil Driscoll's one. Uh, I like old songs. Y'all know that. So I got my list there. But, but for some reason, I went to do that. And on Instagram, on my feed, I saw these prisoners. And I hit it. And I didn't even look at who it was. Oh, I I was in prison and you visited me. When? When you did it unto the least of these, Jesus said, you visited me. Singing holy, holy, 
some students to get an open heart open we need some college kids to get a burden for that campus I want to see sing it one more time open the eyes of my heart open the eyes of my heart Open the Give me a dream to help people. I want to see you. I want to see you. Would you use me, Lord? Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart. Here's my dream. Come on, hold your dreams up. Say, God, I want to make sure they originated from you. So just purify the dream. And God, I look at my gifts and my talents, and I ask you to multiply them and use them for your glory. And God, I won't be intimidated by the magnitude or the smallness. If it's something just handing out a bag to a hurting person of food, what a great dream. You can do something for others that God will bless. As we sing holy, holy, Every head bowed, every eye closed at every campus. It's so important that young people get a dream. Without a vision, people become loose and lax, unrestrained, just become a party animal because you don't know where you're going and you don't have a dream. I don't know why I didn't do this in the last service, but I feel like calling anyone 25 years of age and under to come stand down here in this altar this morning and say, God, give me your dream. Give me your dream. Give me your, we love you. Come on, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. They're coming, we love you so much. God, give me your dream. Give me your dream, Lord. Give me your dream. 
There's never been a generation that Satan has fought more than your generation. He's tried his best to snuff out your dream, to destroy your hope, to just cause you to not believe for greatness and excellence and do anything significant. And But oh, God has a dream for this generation. Come on, they're coming. Man, this is a group right here. Come on, at every campus, the pastors are coming. Just right where you are, that's beautiful. Come on, guys. Come on, come on, come on. We love you. Isn't this something? They're all the way up the aisles, all the way up the aisles. It's beautiful. So powerful. So powerful. So powerful. So powerful. I don't see any grasshoppers. I don't see any insignificance. I don't see any nobodies. I don't see anybody that God cannot use. If you'll throw your hands up and say, open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Take my life. Take my talents. Take my gifts. Take my mess ups. Take my weaknesses. I'm struggling in some areas, but you use weak people. You anoint people who struggle. You don't, you don't ask us out because we're going through some stuff. Use me, God, in my field. I don't want to live somebody else's dream. I don't want to do except that which I was created to do, placed here to do. Give me a bigger dream in my heart for others. Let me see Jesus. Let me see that old cross. Let me see that blood that he shed to wash me and cleanse me. Show me Jesus. As we sing. song to get in your head. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see. I want to see.
You believe it? You believe it? You believe he's got a dream for your life? You believe it, young lady? I want to say to somebody old, you're never too old to dream. Some of you who think you're going to retire, you ain't retiring. You're just going to refire. You, you may sell the business, but God's got something even greater. He saved the best for last. It ought to start by helping us unload all this chicken. I sure can't do it all by myself. We're going to have a great, great time. Do you receive this today? Say, Jesus, thank you for the old rugged cross. Thank you for the blood that you shed. You knew me, and yet you loved me. You knew everything about me, yet you bled and died because you love me. And so I want to thank you for forgiveness. Now use me. Stir up my gifts. Give me a big dream and a great clear vision. Let me take the little steps because big doors hang on little hinges. So if I'll do the little things, you'll do the big stuff. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Man, I wish I could just hug every one of you. You're amazing. Look at you in church on a Sunday morning. Look at you. Look at you. Bless my heart. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine on you, be gracious unto you, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank you for tithing. Thank you for giving. Thank you for being generous. There's giving boxes out in the foyer. You can go online and give. If you believe in the kind of ministry that you know happens here and around the world, all over the world through this ministry, thank you for supporting it. God bless you. Give him your business. Give him a dream that, that, that God can bless, and he'll bless it exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ask or think. We love you all. We're proud of you. Walk in faith. Walk in that dream. It's real. God bless you. What a powerful, powerful yes. service. I said it last time, and I'm so thankful for a pastor who dreams and who believes that we can dream dreams. Yeah. And so I just pray that whatever's been laid on your heart, that you would you would just go after it, that the, the, the Holy Spirit would just prick your heart, whatever God's given you. I just pray that that, that dream becomes reality for you soon. Um, so amazing, amazing service. Yeah, good stuff. If this service touched you and you made the incredible decision to accept Christ today, first of all, congratulations. We are so happy you just made the best decision of your life. Yes. Secondly, we invite you to text YES to 510-510 to let us know that you've made this decision and to allow us to celebrate with you. If you also need prayer this morning, please text PRAYER to 510-510. We have a team of people waiting to pray for you in any way that you need. Absolutely. Hey, we just wanna say thank you so much for your giving. Pastor yeah. has said it over and over again, but we just wanna say thank you for what you've done. You guys have given above and beyond anything that you ever have in the past. And so we just wanna say thank you. Thank you for being the hands and the feet of Jesus. Um, and because of your giving, we're able to do things like we did this week and serve 250 yeah. families food. Um, so we get to extend our hands outside of these four walls of the church. So thank you so much for giving. There's multiple ways to do that. You can go online. Um, to give this morning. Yeah. So. so thank you for giving and thank you for joining us this morning to worship with us, to yes. learn more about Christ with us. It is our honor to host you every Absolutely. Sunday. Next Sunday, please be sure to invite someone else. If this is touching you and making a change in your life, invite that into someone else's life as well. Yes. Invite them to watch with you in your home or send them the link, whatever. We're here for them as well. So Morgan, are you ready for me to pray us out? Sure. Okay. 
Dear God, I just thank you for all that you've done here this morning. Thank you for moving in the hearts of so many yes, people. Jesus. Thank you that we have another opportunity to worship you yes. in community. That means the world that you give us that opportunity every single day and especially on Sunday mornings. Yes, God, we Jesus. thank you for our church family and we especially thank you for our online family that's able to worship all around the Absolutely. world together. That's so special, God. I just ask that you would bless everyone this week as we move forward into our personal lives, that you would just open so many doors for us to be yes, a light Jesus. to the world around us and to learn to serve you better in whatever way that looks like individually for us. God, I just ask your blessing, your protection over every single part of this online family and bring us back safely next week to worship you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We love you guys. See we'll you see next you next week. week.